by the time i'll request if you have any queries please type in the q and a box prior to the session we'll try to cover uh, we'll try to uh, con uh, convey our queries to the speakers and if you have any comments please type in the chat section good evening to one and all By the time, I'll request the participants who are joining us to kindly submit the poll questions. We have launched the poll questions on the screen. I'll request you to kindly um, take the poll questions and give your feedback. A very good evening, Dr. Roshan. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Okay, fine, sir. We'll just begin in a few seconds. Uh, sure. Dr. Sanjeev is also joining us. So, uh, there is some technical glitch from his side. He'll just join us within two to three minutes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this live CME today on recent advances in diagnostic and interventional radiology for hematological diseases. It gives me immense honor and pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Sharma, who is Director, Department of Hemato-Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplant, BLK Max Super Speciality Hospital, New Delhi, and Dr. Roshan Sharma, who is Senior Consultant, Radiology and Imaging, at Venkateshwar Hospitals, New Delhi. The structure for today's CME is, we'll have two speaker session on recent advances in diagnostic and hematological diseases, followed by case presentation by Dr. Sanji and recent advances in interventional radiology for hematological disease by Dr. Roshan. Both the speaker sessions would be followed up by a question and answer session and vote of thanks would be delivered after that. The general instructions for today's webinar are all the participants will be muted during this webinar. If you have any queries, please type in the Q&A section. If you have any comments, please type in the chat section. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar by moderator. This session will be recorded and the recordings would be shared via email notifications once the recorder is available. Polls will be raised at the start as well as at the end of the session for all the participants. We request all the participants to kindly uh, provide their feedback. Our first speaker for today, Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, is Director, Department of Hemato-Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplant at BLK Max Super Speciality Hospital in New Delhi. He has done his MBBS and MD from University College of Medical Sciences, GTB, New Delhi, and received gold medal for the best thesis in, during his MD. During the, his senior residency from uh, PGI Chandigarh, and he's also a DM from prestigious Ames, uh, New Delhi, and he has previously worked as a HOD for Department of Hemato-Oncology Bone Marrow Transplantation at Venkateshwar Hospitals, New Delhi. He has over 15 years of experience and 70 publications to his credit. He has also published 
book uh, for MCQs in hematology for DM and uh, TNB students and give viewer for many journals. Welcome you, sir, today on this platform. Our next speaker is Dr. Roshan Sharma, a senior consultant, Department of Radiology and Imaging, Venkateshwar Hospital, Dwarka. His MBBS from SCB Medical College, Katak, Odisha, and one of that is one of the best medical college in India, and completed his DNB in radiology in the year 20, uh, 2011 from Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center, New Delhi. Uh, and that is also one of the premium institute in the field of oncology. He has previously worked as a consultant radiology in Segal New Hospital, Must and More Diagnostic Center, Ganesh Imaging and Diagnostic, Saral Imaging and Diagnostic Center, and Akash Healthcare. He is also a visiting consultant in Nutis Technology and presently working as a senior consultant in the Department of Radiology and Imaging and also heading the Department of Interventional Radiology. He is trained in Italy by experts from European Institute of Oncology uh, and has done many paper presentation in national and international colleges, conferences. We welcome you uh, to this platform, sir. With this, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll request Dr. Sanjeev to kindly take the session ahead. So am I audible? Uh, so we are not able to hear you. Uh, the participants, there is a small technical glitch. We are just fixing that. Kindly bear with us.
Dr. Roshan, uh, there is a technical glitch from Dr. Sanjeev Singh. I'll request you if you can proceed with your speaker session first. Then we can follow Dr. Sanjeev's session. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. So, uh, in a way. so uh, is, if Dr. Rosen is not starting, I can start, I think. Uh, sir, you can start. Go ahead, sir, please. Okay. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, sir, the slides are visible. Okay. So, just a second. So, yeah. Uh, so slide. Uh, so if you can make it in the slideshow mode. Yeah, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for this glitch. Actually, I my slides were not uh, actually I was not able to share them. And so I I may not be visible, but I will be audible. So I start everyone and I welcome everyone for this uh, evening this diagnostic interventions in hemato oncological diseases. So um, beginning with what are actually hematological diseases so hematological diseases as the name suggests these are blood disorders and uh, we classify them as either uh, benign or malignant hematological diseases and uh, benign as the name suggests these are not uh, cancerous or malignant and uh, malignant means all those blood diseases which are cancerous so um, uh, so what all diseases are included in benign hematological diseases uh, in benign hematological diseases we can divide divide these diseases into three major groups diseases of red blood cells diseases of white blood cells and diseases of platelets now coming to the diseases of red blood cells anemia thalassemia and aplastic anemia are the most common uh, rbc or red blood cell related disorders coming to the diseases of white blood cells we can broadly divide them into leukocytosis that means when the white blood cell number increases and leukopenia penia means less so leukopenia leuko means white so white cells when they are less we call them as leukopenia so there are many conditions which can either lead to increase in white blood cells or decrease in white blood cells similarly diseases of platelets can be divided into thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia thrombocytopenia means platelets are low and in certain diseases the most common being itp that is immune thrombocytopenia and in certain infections like viral and drug infections and viral being most common being the dengue fever we all know that in dengue infections there is decrease in platelet counts other blood diseases are dvt or d vein thrombosis and hemophilia so this is just a basic introduction about blood diseases and now coming to malignant hematological diseases malignant at again, again the, as i told you they are cancerous diseases so blood cancers can be broadly divided into for uh, this division is basically considering what intervention and where we can do uh, in that perspective i have divided these into solid hematological malignancies and liquid hematological malignancies solid means that there the blood cells have collected or accumulated in such a way the cancerous cells that they make a a collection or what you call as a solid swelling 
uh, otherwise the blood is a liquid it keeps on flowing it is produced in the bone marrow all of us know that and it's then comes it comes into the uh, vascular system and it circulates in the whole of the body but we have certain point, uh, stations where these cells get collected and if they become malignant or cancerous they can start producing or overgrowing so lymphoma is one disease you must have heard of lymphoma it is a type of blood cancer but here what happens is that these uh, blood cells they start proliferating in our lymph nodes so this is lymphoma and lymphoma is uh, considered as one of the aggressive cancers or blood cancers another cancer is myeloma here the cancerous cells they grow and they are actually the plasma cells which is the end stage production of b cells and one of the lymphocytes of our uh, hematopoietic system these cells they destroy when they become malignant they destroy our bones kidneys and can even they are actually a fatal diseases so myeloma is again another solid it's not that way solid but they can produce plasmocytomas or solid counterparts then comes myeloid sarcoma myeloid sarcoma is again a leukemia uh, what you call solid counterpart where you can get a collection of these cells in a particular organ anywhere in the body and um, these cells make uh, or cause swelling in that particular area so these are the solid why i have divided them into solid and liquid because for certain interventions Uh, particularly radiological interventions these are the uh, solid organs uh, solid malignancies where we can directly target our needles or our uh, whatever biopsy measures we are going to take to get the adequate sample to diagnose these diseases then comes liquid hematological malignancies and acute lymphoblastic leukemia acute myeloid leukemia chronic lymphocytic leukemia and chronic myeloid leukemia these are the four major liquid hematological malignancies in we, in these cases actually what we do is bone marrow aspiration and biopsy with the needle to diagnose them so for them actually it's not an interventional radiological thing but uh, definitely in all solid hematological malignancies we do need to do interventional radiology and we do take help of dr rosen and our interventionists to diagnose these diseases so uh, about a brief introduction about these blood diseases then i am going to present few cases which will help you know where as a hematologist we need uh, intervention radiologists and in which part of hematology particularly we actually have to make the diagnosis with the help of interventional radiologists so this is the first case where a 38 year old female presented with fever and breathlessness for two weeks her chest x ray showed a large mediastinal mass that means there was a large mass in the her chest her c ct that is the ct scan of the chest showed large mass encasing the major blood vessels there was no cervical or axillary lymphadenopathy so in this case what i am presenting is that there was no axillary or cervical lymph node that means there was no lymph node which could be easily accessed by a surgeon so in a mediastinal or a chest mass actually there it's difficult to get the biopsy done so here under the guidance of fluoroscopy or even guidance of ct scan we uh, ct we can do that uh, needle biopsy or uh, true cut biopsy of that uh, in mediastinal or the chest lesion so you can see this picture where you can see a large mass in the center of the chest and this mass you can see on the ct scan also this is abutting the ribs so this was the large mass and here actually the diagnosis was done with the help of intervention radiologist who with the help of whom we could enter the mass and could make the take out the tissue and make the diagnosis and the diagnosis came out as primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma so it is again a lymphoma as i told you earlier it was a primary means only limited to mediastinum that is the chest and uh, there was no evidence of any disease elsewhere in the body so there was definitely a cancer but it was limited only to the chest so the only way we could make out the diagnosis was with the help of intervention radiologists the second case again these are the small cases a 40 year old male presented with pain abdomen and weakness for 3 weeks his ultrasound showed masses in the liver a ct scan was done which showed large hepatic masses so again here if you are not getting any other easily accessible lymph node and the mass is uh, limited to a particular organ like here in the liver then again we have to go to the intervention radiologist to take their help in making the diagnosis so you can see in these films that 
there were these large masses which you with the arrows these are pointing and uh, to make the diagnosis again intervention radiologist's help was taken and with the help of the biopsy and this primary uh, the diagnosis was made as primary hepatic diffuse large b cell lymphoma again a lymphoma where you can see the collection of these masses and uh, for diagnosis again and the same uh, biopsy with the either CT guided or even ultrasound guided will uh, had helped in making the diagnosis. Here a patient, a third case, a patient with acute leukemia require uh, a peripherally inserted center line. So what happens is when you make a diagnosis of leukemia, these patients then are treated with chemotherapies. And for chemotherapy, because these patients remain admitted for one month and chemotherapies have to be given, these are aggressive chemotherapies. So you need a good line. A line means a good vein from where you can put a central line so that you can keep giving chemotherapies, blood, platelets, whatever and other antibiotics needed during that period through this line. And uh, you can easily take samples from this line. So this is a multi-purpose line and um, this actually we call them as a lifeline because without these lines we can't treat the patients we can't even think of treating these patients with cannulas only so these pick lines are needed in all leukemia patients and we rely and we have to depend on intervention radiologist most of the time to get these lines uh, inserted these central lines can be kept for many weeks and allow gg sampling and infusion of medicines and blood products as i told you so here you can see how with the guidance of ultrasound uh, you can first locate the vein and then you can insert the pick line which then as Dr. Rosen will explain in detail but this is how this intervention we require in our blood cancer patients. Uh, uh, the uh, intervention is required not to make the diagnosis but definitely how to treat the patient for that we need a good access to the central line. Uh, now again this one case you can see here the patient same patient of leukemia after treatment when they develop a severe immunosuppression or when their counts go down their white blood cells platelets are very low particularly the white blood cells are low and this patient developed pneumonia which is a complication of uh, all these blood cancers any uh, these patients do develop any type of uh, infections either bacterial or fungal and uh, for that you need again intervention logists help where they under the guidance of CT or uh, ultrasound can do a needle biopsy of the tissue this biopsy again is important because why important because the treatment differs if it's a fungus and again fungus can be aspergillus or mucor both have different treatment so in that case you have to make a diagnosis and if it is not a fungal but a bacterial infection then you have to give antibiotics accordingly so we do do depend on these interventional radiologists for making these diagnoses with a biopsy with the help of biopsies so uh, and when uh, the same case when uh, uh, ct guided biopsy was done the biopsy revealed a uh, separate hyphae under microscope which was suggestive of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis so this is again a deadly fungal infection where we do need a adequate and optimum treatment to save the patient again another uh, slide where you can see that uh, what has been done is this is a case of lymphoma where he presented with bleeding uh, because the lymphoma was located in his large uh, intestine so even in spite of treating his lymphoma which regressed he continued to have bleeding so in that case uh, this patient was treated where we took intervention radiologist help uh, to block that artery which was bleeding so in that case what you need to do is you have to go through that uh, arterial system to locate the bleeding artery uh, through either fluoroscopy or uh, guidance and uh, then to embolize that artery so that embolization means that stopping or cutting the blood supply uh, distal to that part so that the bleeding can be stopped otherwise this can result in a fatal bleeding so embolization again is a, uh, a again a process where we need help of intervention radiologists now coming to another patient 
a 14 year old child with refractory chronic itp itp means he platelets were not it's immune thrombocytopenia his platelets were getting destroyed within his body so he was refractory to all the medical management to steroids and whatever drugs we give for treatment of itp then he presented to emergency with bleeding from the nose that is epistaxis he has not responded to ivig or steroids and so what is the ultimate treatment or what uh, actually which was earlier done more frequently but now with the availability of many drugs this has taken a back stage is the treatment what we call as splenectomy that is you remove the spleen then also the platelets because platelets are getting destroyed in the spleen so splenectomy helps in resolving this itp or can cure or treat certain group of patients so what was done was that this is the patient you can see splenic artery was located and then it was embolized again embolization means you are cutting the blood supply to that spleen so spleen will get infected it will get necrosed so it's like a, a what you call by embolization you are blocking the artery a, a defunctioning the spleen so that it's like uh, without surgery you can do splenectomy so that is it's equivalent to that so this patient improved after splenic artery embolization again a 60 year old male treated with acute leukemia he was his disease was under control in remission he presented with pain in the chest and a ct scan revealed a mass in the mediastinum the ct guided biopsy from the mass revealed it to be a myeloid sarcoma his bone marrow examination was normal this showed extramurally relapse of ml so what i am trying to tell here is that this was a case of liquid malignancy that is acute myeloid leukemia we treated him with chemotherapy he blood cancer was cured his disease was cured so his bone marrow test and everything revealed normal but later on he presented with mass in the chest again a chest mass in a patient who we have whom we have treated with chemotherapy his bone marrow and other blood tests are not showing any malignancy or cancer but when we with the help of again intervention radiologist we took a biopsy from that area it showed myeloid sarcoma that means that area has developed acute leukemia or the leukemia cells they are not present in the blood but they are present they are in a located localized way in that mediastinum so this is again we call it as a relapse of aml that is the aml has relapsed though it is not uh, present in the bone marrow so these patients are to be treated again like aml only so again here uh, myeloid sarcoma is entity where you need help of intervention radiologists a 70 year old male was evaluated for pain in the upper back for two months ct scan revealed a pulmonary nodule suspecting a malignancy because his age was 70 years and there was a nodule a ct guided leave a needle biopsy of the solitary nodule was done and it showed solitary plasmocytoma there was no evidence of multiple myeloma he was treated with local rt and completely resolved so what happens you can see this ct scan picture where this patient had only one small nodule and he presented with weakness and other complaints but we were not able to make out the diagnosis with his other tests which can be easily done without going for this invasive biopsy but ultimately since we were not able to make diagnosis we had to take the biopsy of this lesion and it showed plasmocytoma that is again a collection of plasma cells which are localized to a particular area only and they were causing the disease a elderly male eighth case was being evaluated for weight loss and weakness for two months his ct scan showed vertebral lesions and a ct guided biopsy from the lesion revealed metastatic adenocarcinoma from unknown primary so again here you can see and the vertebra or the rib uh, this uh, spine bone is showing some lesion so he was having weakness he was having all the symptoms which a cancer patient has but uh, we were not able to make the diagnosis so again a needle biopsy was done ct guided and it showed that there was adenocarcinoma or there was some cancer which has come to the bones but the from where it has come that is the primary which uh, were was not being uh, found or we were not able to find the primary from where it has started or it has begun so these were the few cases which uh, as a hematologist we do need help of intervention radiologists and uh, so uh, this actually before ending i just want um, my listeners to go through these questions and if they have any answers i would be like happy to know if they have understood whatever i was willing to tell 
so like in which investigation is better for diagnosis of lymphoma fnac or biopsy so as i explained to you because uh, what happens is in fnac uh, dr roshan will be better explaining you but it's a needle which we put whereas uh, with biopsy what we do is we take a good bunch chunk of uh, a tissue so making a diagnosis for lymphoma requires a biopsy because you can make the architectural everything of that lymphoma better than an fnac in which you can make out only few cells you can take only some of the cells which will may not give you the correct diagnosis the second question is what precautions should be taken in hematological patients before considering for any radiological interventions this is again an important thing because as i told you our cancer patients most of them are thrombocytopenic that is with chemotherapy or even without chemotherapy their platelets remain very low some of these patients do develop dic that is disseminated intravascular coagulation in which they have increased bleeding tendency due to coagulopathy prolonged pt aptt in these patients who have coagulopathy or low platelets the uh, the intervention sometimes becomes very difficult because of risk of bleeding so either you have to optimize the patient to give platelets and uh, ffp as needed and then do or I, sometimes you have to uh, go away without doing uh, any intervention then which investigation is better for definitive diagnosis of fungal pneumonia again i saw saw you the uh, uh, picture where fungal pneumonia patient or pneumonia patient was there ball is bronchoalveolar lavage that is you can put a tube through the chest uh, through the oral cavity into the lungs and you can take some fluid from there or ct guided lung biopsy that is you directly assess that area and take out a biopsy or tissue so ideally ct guided biopsy should be done if it is feasible and accessible in these patients because it gives a clear and more better answer than ball now coming to one of the papers which actually i published when i was in aims the feasibility and the end this was my thesis paper so feasibility and outcome of ct guided lung biopsy in patients with hematological diseases with suspected fungal pneumonia so all these patients which uh, i have mentioned here all aml patients they developed some lesions in their ct scans and uh, in these patients we suspected uh, fungal pneumonia and in some of these patients in the table 2 we can see we were able to do ct guided lung biopsy and in these patients we were able to make out the diagnosis in a quite number of th these patients which helped in getting the exact treatment so reasons why as i told you we may not be able to perform lung biopsy in certain patients because of low platelets our patients are too sick because cancer patients these blood cancer patients are sometimes very sick you can't do any intervention or because of coagulopathy or because patients sometimes do not give consents for these lung biopsies so these are the reasons where we actually even if we want in hematology patients particularly we can't actually sometimes do these biopsies so thanks that's all and uh, i hope uh, you all were able to get where actually i wanted to tell in what we do in our hematological patients and i think dr roshan will better explain the procedures thank you thank you so much sir it was a very wonderful presentation and i hope our audience must have gained many insight towards the diagnostics uh now i'll request dr roshan to kindly take over the platform for the speaker session this one this one this one we'll go through the slides just to yeah this one If I can, um, I'll request the audience if you have any questions to kindly type in the Q and A box. We'll address the question after both the speaker session. we have received many wonderful comments towards the last speaker session thank you all the audience so the screen is visible am i audible yes sir you are audible okay hi uh, good evening everybody thank you sir for a nice presentation and uh, sir has uh, told many interest has told many interesting cases so i will highlight in some things we we are we in day to day practice we do in ir 
so in coming to intervention radiology it is the four pillar of cancer care medical surgical and radiation oncology after that intervention radiology is the fourth pillar of intervention of oncology so it is occupying an important part not only in uh, making diagnosis but also in making treatment and also in palliation of the patients dr sir your slides are not moving i think nahi sir it is the first slide i am showing okay. next slide i am coming and uh, generally in ir we use image guided procedure to enhance the cancer care and this was the article in the article the oncology it has been published in 2018 so three pillar three parts of intervention radiology diagnosis therapy and palliation so what are the advantages of intervention radiology so most of the procedures are performed in local anesthesia or with mild sedation they can be perform in day care as a day care procedure or can be dis- or we can discharge the patient next day after performing the procedure and observe for one day more patient centered and personalized treatment approach is done and localized effect on tumor with minimal side effects sorry sir the slides are not moving not moving right now also no sir so we are uh, we are just seeing a radiological uh, screen just okay. just So you need to uh, share the complete screen. it's visible now sir it is on the slide show mode now okay so it's visible now yes sir it's so visible. as i mentioned prior there are four pillars of cancer care medical oncology surgical oncology radiation and intervention oncology and intervention oncology is a major part in the field of oncology including diagnosis treatment so the oncology journal, journal in 2018 they published and they quoted that uses of image guided procedures is there to enhance the cancer care so in intervention radiology it the field varies from diagnosis to therapy to palliation and the advantage is is the most of the procedures are performed in local anesthesia or with mild sedation day care procedure mostly done as day care procedure or patient can be discharged next day more patient centered and personalized treatment approach there is localized effect on tumor with minimal side effects so as sir has told the, he has given the uh, brief classification of hematological diseases so i will not go in detail to that so i am straight away i am coming to the ir procedures generally we perform in our day to day setting so first coming to the fluid tapping so fluid tapping it can be either aseptic tapping or pleural tapping then coming to fnscs or biopsies icd or pigtail placement central venous access then ablative procedures including rfa and microwave and embolizations so central venous access hd catheter and pick lines are being uh, placed using ultrasound guidance so it's real time imaging and uh, in real time imaging in using ultrasound we can directly see the target we can assess the veins properly and there is we there is uh, in blind technique there is chance of damage to the surrounding structure so in ultrasound guidance we are specific so we can see the target we can see the movement of the needle so damage to surrounding structure is very minimal so and intra procedural complications are less 
and right igv is the most preferred route for placement of uh, sd catheters central vena success so this is a case the patient is uh, positioned and we uh, this is the this is the kit we generally under ultrasound guidance i'll show in the next slides here now it's an interesting case patient came to us for placement of the sd catheter so when we go for right igv the right igv there is uh, chronic thrombus is there you can see these areas these are chronic thrombus lying in the right igv so we choose the left igv left igv clear so we punctured the left igv with ultrasound guidance after giving local anesthesia and uh, in the cath lab after giving local anesthesia after the puncture we pass the guide wire through the puncture needle then through the right atrium to the right ventricle the guide wire go to the ivc so it's a safe access and the uh, pr procedure performed nicely without any complications now pick line pick line generally gives access to large veins near heart we used to give medication and as sir told also to collect samples so it's a schematic diagram this is the catheter tail with cap and we for generally it's being performed mainly we generally prefer before uh, planning we generally choose the superficial veins whether cephalic or basilic their root is there any thromboplevitis is there any chronic thrombus or can we go through the veins easily so before planning for the procedure we assess the patients we choose to go for the right arm or the left arm where we can perform the procedure easily this is your uh, uh, pick line kit we have a puncture needle after giving puncture as sir has told under ultrasound guidance we give the puncture this is the puncture needle inserting the vein and this is the vein pre prior assist after puncture the guide wire is placed through this needle after putting the guide wire through the guide wire a dilator is being put to uh, dilate the track and after the dilator we generally remove the dilator the and the needle after that we generally put the uh, a cannula okay another uh, catheter kind of thing so after putting the catheter through that we generally put the pick line and after putting the pick line there are marks are there so we can assume how much we have to put and how much pick line will be inside and how much length will be outside so after that we generally go for a check x ray to see whether the pick line is in correct position or we have to withdraw or we have to insert some more after confirming with the chest x ray the pick line is being sealed in the proper place now coming to fluid tapping fluid tapping can be aseptic fluid tapping pleural fluid tapping or we can play, uh, we can place pictal catheters or pleurex catheter which are being uh, used nowadays in uh, many field many uh, cases so this is the uh, this is the tray for aseptic tapping so we generally use 16 gauge cannula and 10 cc syringe gloves and ivc durovag and gauze so this is the ultrasound image of a patient the black area is the aseptic fluid and you can see some bright spot here this is after putting the needle so we choose the maximum depth after choosing the maximum depth we put the local anesthesia and after waiting for some time after a local anesthesia anesthetize the area we put the 16 gauge cannula then we draw the uh, stilet and throw the cannula which generally connected to the uh, ivc through the and finally to the urovac so fluid drained out so there is less chance of injury to the underlying bowel loops this is a pleurex catheter generally uh, under ultrasound guidance the proper position where to make the track is marked then after that uh, putting the local this is a track after putting local anesthesia the track is dilated and then the cath uh, through the uh, puncture needle it's being inserted to the, the needle is inserted in the pleural space and after inserting the pleural space through the guide wire 
the uh, catheter is being placed into the guide wire and through that catheter this jo uh, plastic cannula this is a plastic this is plastic this is being placed through the catheter into the tubal space and this is the lock and unlock area it's not clearly visible so after doing all these things we generally suture the, the uh, tube here on the chest wall and the patient goes home with the tube inside so whenever needed the locking and locking process is here and a bottle is connected here so whenever there is need the patient unlock and fluid came out after this the patient again lock and it remains under the uh, sealed area so morbidity is not that much to the patient now coming to uh, uh, your pigtail placement i'm just showing a case it's a uh, small procedure but it helps a lot to the patient this patient came to us with a large hydronemothorax and oxygen saturation was falling then we are being call, uh, called to the icu in a emergency situation then after reviewing the x ray and under ultrasound guidance after uh, taking the area how to put a pigtail we put a 12 french 14 french pigtail here in this in, in this lung pleural space so up this is the x ray which uh, which was done on 10 o'clock 4 hours after putting the pigtail this is the x ray so there is marked improvement in the aeration of the patient and now, now the patient is fine now coming to fnc and biopsy it can be ultrasound or ct guided ultrasound is real time imaging we can see the tract very well but in ct there is better anatomical details and if there is any complications that can be better evaluated by ct scans ct is particularly useful in thoracic pelvic and retroperitoneal biopsy now recent advances is fusion image guided system so what happen in fusion image guided system uh, there is setting in the machine ultrasound machines so before uh, doing the real time ultrasound your ct or mr image will be loaded in the system so accordingly you will do the ultrasound so in ultrasound screen side by side you can correlate where is was the lesion in the ct or mri and where you are in the ultrasound so if you can better delineate the thing and go for the procedure so now coming to uh, fnc you can see this is a neck node and uh, you can see the needle clearly entering into the node now coming to biopsy this patient present to the large retroperitoneal mass so patient was planned for biopsy we generally puncture the needle it's not clearly seen we puncture needle in this trajectory through the left lower bladder into the lesion and we took the sample from here and it came out to be lymphomatous lesion now coming to the this this case the patient was a treated case of lymphoma and in follow up presented with bilateral lung lesions so patient was planned for biopsy and uh, prone position was being done and this is the biopsy gun through which sample was taken and it came out to be positive due to a metastatic disease this 25 year old female presented with a large It was done from the medicinal side is came out to be lymphoma. Now coming to the admitting procedure, uh, RFA and microwaves are done. RFA there is thermal injury to the tissue through electromagnetic energy deposition. There is permanent tissue destruction occurs in more than forty five degree temperature. Um, sorry to disturb, sir. So the voice is breaking. Uh, voice breaking. Yeah, it is fine now. So, permanent tissue damage destruction occurs. Temperature is 60 degrees, and there is coagulation of the tissue 
when the temperature is 60 to 100 degree and there is boiling vaporization and ultimately carbonization of the tissue when the temperature reaches more than 100 degree so you can see the image under ultrasound that this is the, this is the lesion the graph is schematic this is the uh, tumor so under ultrasound guidance the rfa probe is inserted into the lesion these are the probes used in the rfa so i'm coming into a case you can see a case here small lesion in the right lobe of liver which was showing activity in pet city metabolic active lesion so uh, rfa was done and post rfa you can see no activity here this is the post rfa changes coagulative necrosis has occurred and it's not showing any activity in follow-up scan so micro the physics of microwave there is oscillation of polar water molecules and it leads to frictional heating and ultimately there is cellular death via coagulation necrosis so there is coagulation zone and sharing zone so you can see the white area these are the water bubbles forming vapor this is the microwave probe entering into a lesion and the lesion is there is evidence of coagulant necrosis in polyp scans i am not told of the image of the polyp scan This is another case of a RFA. This was the lesion. And in follow-up scan, we are not clearly able to see the lesion. Now coming to embolation. Taste. It's a minimally invasive method of administering chemotherapy to the liver tumor. So chemoembolic agent can be delivered as a mixture with lipid oil, which is called as conventional taste, or as an injection of drug eluting bits, drug taste. So what is done being done in taste? Femoral puncture is assessed, femoral, puncture is, femoral artery is being punctured, and the access is secured through a seat. And through that, a guide wire is being inserted, and uh, see we inject the contrast. Then we can put lesion from the right side or left side, and selective angiogram is done, PSA. Then accordingly, we approach the targeted artery and after reaching the targeted artery, we inject the chemotherapeutic agents to uh, block the artery. You can see on the image, this is the angiogram. The blast area is the tumor. The whole blast area is the tumor. The artery is the at the branching, uh, the, the catheter is the uh, tip of the supply artery. After injecting the chemotherapy agent, you can see there is no plus in the tumor area. These white areas which are seen here, these are due to the injected chemotherapeutic drugs. So coming to, uh, next coming to the slide, intervention reducing the management of complication. So due to large masses, there may be chance of delay of obstruction. So primary or metastatic nodal disease at the very higher or very penetrant region can lead to obstruct the cement, leading to direction of the ISVR. And there is a uh, patient presented with jaundice. So PT is an effective method for palliative management. And metallic stent placement can also be done in common bile duct. So I am showing some cases. This is a case presented with the uh, after obstruction, there is increased bilirubin. So we did, did a PT bleeding and internalized the catheter. The catheter is crossed with the tissue papilla. This is the tissue papilla. So the bilirubin came down and patient took symptomatically. This is another case post CVD stenting. There was obstruction. So patient can be raised bilirubin. Then again, uh, patient turned to us for to put a PTVD. So we did the puncture. After puncturing, we entered into the stent. Through the stent, we entered into the duodenum. So the bile came out from here, external drainage, and also to the internal drainage. And the bilirubin came down. Now coming to CVD stenting, patient presented with a retroperitoneal mass of stenting the second part of duodenum. 
so patient referred to us for ptvd and cvd if possible cvd stenting so we perform the ptvd we internalize this to the uh, uh, duodenum and after that we put a metallic stent over here you see the narrowed area this is the uh, mass effect this, this is mainly due to the mass effect we could not dilate more because the uh, compression was much so we put a metallic stent it's a uh, 12 cm and 80 mm dilated stent now the patient is symptomatically better now uh, one more thing in renal obstruction so in renal obstruction pcn catheter can be placed Uh, due to many situations in retrograde lesion, they can uh, block the ureter, so the creatinine level rises. So what we do generally, we generally puncture the kidney to the lower pole cal. After puncturing, we put the guider and through the guider we dial. After that, the ureters guy they try to negotiate after uh, giving chemotherapy or something. So they generally try to put a stent, major stent. So thank you so much for your attention and time. I think uh, I have met something, some brief ideas about the interventional procedures we generally do in our day-to-day -day practice. So thank you for this. Thank you so much, sir, for your presentation and telling us about the day-to-day -day practices. Uh, we have certain questions in the uh, Q and A box. I can see Dr. Sanjeev is already typing the answer to some of the questions. Uh, so, sir, like, what is your take on bone marrow aspiration as lymphoma diagnosis? Um, is interventional radiology better or aspirate in periphery? Uh, Dr. Roshan, if you could like to answer this. No, no. Again, please post your question. Um, so this is the question that is asked by Ankita Jain uh, in the Q&A box. What is your take on bone marrow aspiration as lymphoma diagnosis, interventional radiology better or aspirate in periphery? I think in uh, if there is any difficult case which is not accessible easily for bone marrow, in that case, uh, bone marrow aspiration can be done in uh, CT or scopic gardens. Okay. Um, I hope uh, Ms. Ankita uh, be and be patient able to patient understand. compliance is also much more important. So many factors are there. Uh, so your voice is not audible. Sorry. Am I audible right now? Yes, sir. It is coming at a low pitch, sir. Volume. So what I was telling, it all depends. It all depends on the patient compliance. If it it can be performed easily at the periphery, then it's okay. If it cannot be performed easily. And we can go ahead under CT or fluoroscopic lens. Or the team approach will be better in a difficult case. Thank you so much, sir. Um, so with this, we are uh, like we are moving towards the end of the webinar for today. So before that, uh, I'll request Dr. Sanjeev, sir, if you have any closing remarks for our audience today, a take-home message. I request yeah. you to. Yeah, first I would like to thank everyone for their patient listening and uh, thanks to you for organizing this nice meeting here. So uh, yeah, I would like to say that uh, there are many diseases and uh, many diseases means there are many, many blood disorders or non-hematological disorders where we do need help of other doctors and intervention radiologists are those doctors which actually with their knowledge of radiology, body, anatomy and with the help of uh, their techniques they can make help us in making diagnosis 
so if we are suspecting any cancer anywhere in the body whether it's a solid organ cancer or it's a blood cancer we at one or the some at one or other point do need intervention radiologists so it's a team effort everyone in their field are expert and so with the help of everyone we do make and treat the patients thank you Thanks. so much sir uh, for your, I really hope that our audience today must have gained many, you know, knowledgeable insights related to this topic. Uh, I'll request Dr. Roshan if you have any closing remarks for the audience today, uh, your take home message. Thank you, sir, and thank to you for giving the opportunity to share my views, especially in this platform. And I think I have briefed some. As I mentioned, nothing but interdisciplinary field, starting from neuro, supercutaneous. So I have just briefed some procedures which are generally done. And in coming to hemat oncology, as sir has mentioned, it's a team approach many times. And uh, so it's a team approach, so which helps to shorten the time and help to uh, get uh, quick diagnosis, quick treatment, and so that the patient will be helpful in any way. That's the Thank most you important so thing. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, my sincere thanks to Dr. Roshan and Dr. Sanjeev for taking up this session uh, towards uh, the role of diagnostic and interventional radiology for hematological diseases. It has been a pleasure to have you both on our platform. And we really hope that we can conduct many multiple CMEs towards the topic of hematological diseases and others. Uh, the recording of this session would be available on our platform called medicallearninghub.com uh, within two to three working days. And the online participation certificate would be given to all the live attendees uh, within uh, seven to 10 working days. And I would also like to thank Ms. Shweta for coordinating uh, on behalf of Vankateshwar Hospital. Uh, towards the CME and uh, thank you both of you and my uh, and lastly I would like to thank the participants uh, who have joined us today for this wonderful CME. Uh, we wish you a great learning experience and uh, lastly I would like to thank Mr. Maya Swift for supporting us throughout this session. Thank you thank all. You so thank you everyone. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Awesome. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, sir. Good night, everybody. Good, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Uh, we have received many wonderful comments. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, if you have any queries, please type us to at info at the rate medicallearninghub.com. Uh, we would be happy to answer you back. Thank you all. We are here for another two to three minutes. I'll request you to kindly submit the poll questions on the screens. If you're facing any troubles, kindly let us know. Thank you.